Now that we have a working screen plus a dev kit and the ribbon cables finally attached properly, we can play with the Librem 5 dev kit properly. Before we get into this, let's talk about the elephant in the room. The graphics are not that smooth, and this is because the open source GPU driver needs some work. Looking past the slow GPU drivers, we can look at the GUI and how it will be like to use. The keyboard is defaulting to a opened position, and definitely looks nicer than it did in the early VM build. I think a lot of you guys are going to be interested in seeing the web browser, so let's pop around that for a bit. So I'm loading up YouTube here just because it's super heavy, and I want to stress the hell out of this device to see what it might be capable of when it actually releases. It definitely is chunking along here. Scrolling is sluggish. Let's pick a random video to play. Wow, it's almost smooth. It's definitely a video. <laughs> There are definitely some rendering issues where the right side of the display is kind of cut off and not really accessible. Okay, well, let's take a look at something else. It looks like DuckDuckGo is the default search engine, so props on that. Uh, it's just a simple web page, but hey, looks like multi-touch is working. That's pretty cool. And we can save things. Control S on the keyboard. All right, they have a file selection screen. This will be at least reminiscent to how the file browser will eventually look. As you can see here, the image did save successfully. Oh, I randomly selected a bit of text. At least we can check out the copy-paste menu. It looks pretty snazzy, simple, right there, barely enough. All right, let's run a speed test on the browser, because that's an HTML5 app, and HTML5 apps seem to be working pretty well. So run that up. Of course, the right side's cut off. But the app is functioning, it is testing my speed. Clicking on an audio file results in the web browser trying to display the audio file's contents. Uh, not quite right. And the video files do seem to work. So you can click on a raw video file and it opens up in its own little tab. All right, well, let's download this and try to play it on something else other than the browser because it's chunking along and cuts off a little early. Video downloaded. All in all, the web browser's not doing so bad. The multi-touch support is there, so it has a lot of promise. And once the GPU driver is sorted out, it's going to be just a little bit of rendering issues that need to be resolved, specifically with that right side being chopped the hell off. And some random chat window popped up. Looks like a cool feature, though, if I could pop up the chat window purposefully with chats in it. Uh, we kept running into this now and then. Definitely a GPU driver thing. At this point, we SSH in and use system CTL restart Fosh to recover the Fosh shell. And due to the lack of a file browser, we can't really attempt to open our saved file just by clicking on it. So we're going to go ahead and open up Document Viewer. Okay, Document Viewer's interface is particularly unstable. Moving on. I'm really not sure how to close apps from this app drawer. <laughs> okay, we'll have to install mPlayer. Easy enough, because it's, you know, based on Debian, apt get install and player. So playing the video seems to crash the interface, um, but playing with just audio works great. Next, let's take a look at the calendar UI. Adding a new appointment is pretty simple. You just kind of tap it and type in details, and you can edit those details, repeat, reminders, how long it's going to be. And again, the right side of the screen is cut off. We are looking at you, libhandy. We'll talk more about that in a bit. Next, we pull out the SIM card from my phone, shove it in an adapter, and shove it into the dev kit. I blame the adapter, but uh, this was a very tight fit, and I actually had to use pliers to pull out the SIM card when we were done testing. <laughs> so we reboot the device with the SIM card in. The cellular icon did change to, well, that. Um, and we did try to make a couple calls. The result of every call, though, was either a hung interface, a completely crashed Fosh, or in one case we got a timed out error, and some interesting D messages talking about the modem registration state. I'll definitely need to pop into the dev form and see if there's some extra steps that I'm missing to get this hooked up properly to T-Mobile. At some point we had to reboot, and we tried it with the interface, just clicking on the power button there. It didn't give us any indications that it was rebooting, 
except that it became unresponsive and eventually just did reboot. It is a valid way to reboot, but I would definitely push for a menu that says, are you sure you want to reboot? Popping in an SD card formatted with ext4 worked just fine. lsblk shows that the SD card was detected and is mountable. We didn't test with any Windows formats like FAT or NTFS, but I don't really need access to those formats. I'd rather just use the Linux ext4 format. Okay, everybody loves to x-forward their desktop, but um, now you can x-forward your phone's desktop. Purism has some pretty simple directions to follow if you want to x-forward over SSH your Fosh display. This headless setup works pretty well for me at home, and uh, maybe my preferred way to run the GUI, but does add some extra lag as it is dumping a lot of the display shit over the network. Although, I was surprised to see there were fewer graphical glitches running this way. My guess is this means Lip Handy is just not quite tuned right at the display resolution of the Librem 5. So it might not even be very hard for them to resolve all of these settings issues and weird little glitches where the display is cut off too far right. So if you want to tweak your settings, just uh, set up SSH and X forward your display. <laughs> Some of the funny issues we ran into, rotation actually worked better in the VM than it did on the actual phone. With the keyboard defaulting to an up state, if you just hit the rotation button, you end up with the keyboard in full screen, and no way to make it not full screen. The next funny thing we did was audio recording. The result of this was a success, kind of. We couldn't get anything to record shy of outright screaming at the dev kit, so, uh... This is a test of the audio! Turns out it can record if you scream at it. We also saw a weird crash where the keyboard ended up on top and it looked like the application space was on bottom. Pretty weird crash. As you can see, fighting against the GPU bugs were the biggest issue. The graphical glitches all the time and the locked up GPU states that it was causing. But if you can look past all of that, you can see this is coming along and will be quite an interesting device. Thank you all for watching. Bye.